Hello. Thanks for joining today's ASGCT Lunch and Learn, Pathway to Approval for Gene Therapies. I'm delighted today about today's topic and the thoughts our panelists have to share with you all. Today marks the seventh session of the Lunch and Learn series. You can find all previous sessions along with a library of Gene Therapy 101 and other helpful materials free and on demand on ASGCT's website. My name is Betsy Bogard, and I'm the head of program and alliance management at Insoma, a startup biotechnology company developing gene therapy for cancer and rare diseases. I'm also a member of the ASGCT Patient Outreach Committee. Today, we have the pleasure of hearing from two distinguished panelists, Emily McGinnis and Kenneth Hobby, who will talk about the process of developing a gene therapy from clinical trials through FDA approval. Together, Kenneth and Emily will be drawing on their shared experience in spinal muscular atrophy, or SMA, a rare genetic disease, progressive and neurodegenerative in nature. Emily will talk about the clinical trials process from her industry perspective, and in particular, her time working on Zolgensma, a gene therapy approved for the treatment of SMA. And Kenneth will share his patient community perspective on gene therapy approval as president of the nonprofit organization, Cure SMA. Kenneth and Emily met about six years ago before the SMA community had any treatments available. Today, there are three marketed products for SMA, including Zolgensma, that collectively treat 70% of SMA patients. SMA used to be the number one fatal disease in infants, and now it isn't. I'm really excited to hear from Kenneth and Emily on the pathway to get there. Please don't forget to submit questions to the Q&A for discussion at the end of our panelists' conversation. To begin, I'd like to welcome Emily McGinnis, Chief Patient Officer and Head of Government Affairs at Tasha Gene Therapies. Emily's career in biotechnology spans over 20 years in roles that include medical affairs, government affairs, and patient advocacy. Prior to joining Tasha, Emily had strategic oversight of patient advocacy and government affairs at Avexis, the developer of Zolgensma. Emily holds a master's degree in public health from the University of Illinois at Chicago. Emily, welcome. It's um, truly an honor um, to be here today. Like Betsy, um, I've had the great opportunity to serve on ASGCT's patient outreach committee, and um, I was thrilled to be asked to, to speak today. Um, as Betsy mentioned, um, really what I want to talk about is, is an example, and, and using Zolgensma as an example, of a gene therapy um, pathway to approval. And then talk a little bit about some of the, the learnings from, um, from this approval and, and pathway and how patients, families, and advocacy groups can support this process. I, I, I will say before I get started that working with um, Kenneth, Cure SMA, the SMA community was such an incredible honor. And, um, you know, what I'll speak today are some of my personal experiences and learnings and then share really publicly available information related to um, the, the pathway for Zolgensma. Before I get started, I think it's important to get grounded on um, the number of gene therapy approvals. You know, there, there really has been a limited number to date. Um, this chart here is it actually comes from a report that ASGCT puts out and um, it's there's a link at the bottom that we'd be happy to send out um, if you'd like to see that 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 really puts a ni nice summary of not only the clinical trial clinical trials that are in development for gene therapies but also um, the the approvals so as of Q2 of this year um, there were 19 gene therapies approved globally and this includes genetically modified cell therapies as well. There's 18 RNA therapies that are approved and then 59 non-genetically modified cell therapies that are approved as well. 
But since this report came out, it's um, wonderful to see that, that Bluebird Bio had two um, recent gene therapy approval approvals that are that are listed here, Zinteglo um, on August 17th, and then Skysona in, um, in September. So great to see more gene therapies um, being approved. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about what, what can we learn from the approved gene therapies. And I think one key point is that each gene therapy has its own unique path. As I mentioned earlier, there, there really are relatively small number of gene therapies, and um, the path is unique, and it's also important to know that it's, it's, it's really different than the typical drug development process. The second point is that manufacturing of gene therapies is complex, but also um, a critical aspect of approval. You know, I think it's important to note that for a gene therapy to be approved, the process that's used for manufacturing for a clinical trial also needs to be how, how they're going to use that for um, approvals. Because sometimes gene therapy early trials will start um, using a smaller lab process, but then have to move over to a, um, a, a larger, different processing to, to make it available for a broader population. So I think that's one key point to remember. Um, the other piece is that natural history studies are important to support the disease. I'll talk a little bit about that um, in, in, the, in today. And because often they can serve as a comparator rather than placebo, but there are, are many other things that can be helpful with natural history studies, such as helping to define endpoints and, um, sorry, the cat. <laughs> she wants to help, helping to find endpoints um, as well as, as, as um, you know, really helping um, to identify the, the proper patient selection. And then lastly, as I mentioned earlier, you know, patients, families, and advocacy groups are vital um, to the path to approval and also post-approval, which Kenneth will, will speak to as well. Um, just wanted to ground everybody next in the process of clinical trials. Um, the figure here is from ASGCT, so from the Patient Outreach Committee. There, there's, um, again, a link at the bottom that we'd be happy to share of a number of different really resources to, to clinical trials and the clinical trial process, and this is, this is one of the resources. So first, it's important to know that, that clinical trials are, are studies. And, and really the goal is to first establish safety and efficacy. Each phase builds upon each other to help answer a different question about the treatment. And, and lastly, an important note, it's the, the phases can be combined, or often you might hear them referred to as an early phase, late stage, or a pivotal stage of a development. So what you see in the, the um, the chart on the left is, you know, first and foremost, there's a lot of preclinical work that needs to happen before a clinical trial can be started. And this, again, helps establish potential safety and efficacy in animal models. Then that preclinical information is submitted to the um, regulatory authorities. Um, so in the U.S., it would be the FDA and they, they're as a submission of an IND, or an investigational new drug application. And that must be um, submitted before a phase one clinical trial can be started. Typically, a phase one clinical trial involves fewer participants and is, is again, looking to establish safety and finding the right dose for the gene therapy. Um, phase two, if, if a phase two occurs, is again, um, includes more, more participants and potentially have multiple sites. Um, using the, the outcomes from the phase one trial, again, um, wanting to have it measure more efficacy, but also, again, safety is critically important as well. The last piece is phase three. Um, often, um, People refer to it as a pivotal trial or confirmation trial, and this is the largest um, phase trial where um, it has the most number of participants. And again, the desired um, outcome is to establish safety, confirm safety, and efficacy. And then, of course, you take all that data and submit 
um, for FDA approval. And, and in the case of gene therapies, it's a BLA or the biologics license application that's submitted and FDA will determine safety and efficacy and whether or not um, it can be approved for a broader use. I'll talk a little bit about this next as, I, as we look to Zolgensma as an example. Um, this, this chart here was adapted from, um, from a paper that was published um, in 2019. And what's not on here, and, and I don't have a reference to, is um, the, the length of the preclinical stage. And I, again, I think that varies. Um, what I've seen is, um, you know, it could take numerous years, um, oftentimes even to create the right construct, understand, you know, the proper dosing in animals. So I don't have that example to provide today, but this does show the path from phase one, phase three, and approval. And so this is an example of a trial that had a phase one trial called the START trial. So you'll, and that started in May of 2014 which was for SMA type one, a subtype of SMA um, for, for patients less than six months of age. I'm not gonna go into detail about the disease because Kenneth's going to speak to about that later, but I think it's important to note that most clinical trials will start with a narrow subset of patients um, and then potentially broaden with, with other future studies. So that was, that was a study that started, as I mentioned, in May of 2014 and then completed in December of 2017, so a little over three years. And then um, FDA, after discussions with the FDA, they requested that, that, um, that there is a confirmatory trial for, for the gene therapy for SMA, and that was the STRIVE trial. And that was, again, to confirm safety and efficacy and then also to confirm a, a different manufacturing process. Like I mentioned earlier, there was a different manufacturing process that was used in the START trial and in the STRIVE trial, they, um, th there was a need to, to confirm the manufacturing process that was going to be used for approval. So um, what, what was able to happen was during the STRIVE trial, um, the, there was a um, BLA submitted to FDA, as you can see that happened in late 2018. And um, there was a priority review granted. I'll speak a little bit about those designations in a bit. And, um, and, and Zilgensma was approved for the treatment of SMA type one um, in May of May 24th, 2019. And this was an actual this was actually an approval for all SMA, not just SMA type one. Um, so SMA patients who are less than two years of age. So um, a little different than the study, a little a little broader. Um, then um, there were additional trials that were completed, the or started and completed the SPRINT trial, which was another phase three trial for SMA type one for pre-symptomatic patients. The STRIVE EU trial, so a similar STRIVE trial that was in the U.S., and then um, one that occurred in Asia Pacific. So. Um, so then you can see there were other approvals globally, um, EMA in May of 2020, Canada, December of 2020. And last, um, the report that I saw from, from Novartis was that in, in June of 2021, there were 40 countries that had um, Zolgensma approved for the treatment of SMA. And, and the indications vary. Um, I, I won't, I'm not going into the details here. And as I mentioned, I think, I think it's important to note because oftentimes um, there's press releases and information put out about these regu regulatory milestones. So flagged here on this chart are different regulatory milestones that occurred along the way, and I'll spend some time um, describing those. So um, ones listed here were orphan drug status, um, shortly after the phase one trial was, was started, that, that was um, granted by the regulatory authorities in um, the United States as well as the EU. Um, in 2016, you'll see there was a breakthrough designation in the United States and then short and then early 2017 prime in the EU. In 2018, there was a Sagagaki de um, designation in Japan. Um, and then I spoke to you a bit earlier about the priority review. So 
what does that mean? I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what, oftentimes we put out press releases at Tasha that talk about those different designations. And I can imagine it's confusing for families because they're wondering, um, and we get the questions, does that mean that it's approved? What does that mean? So my hope here is to, to, to summarize what those means. Um, and really, you know, these, these regulatory designations were created to help expedite um, and, and encourage development in rare diseases as well as um, gene therapies, especially in diseases with very high unmet need. So the orphan drug designation I'll start with um, is, is really, again, helps to, it was, the hope was to help stimulate drug development in, in the rare disease space. So um, this, this designation allows for tax credits um, for clinical trials for, to the manufacturer, um, exemption or a fee reduction um, when working with the FDA, um, additional marketing exclusivity, exclusivity after approval, as well as um, additional scientific advice from regulatory agencies, the ability to gain more feedback along the pathway to approval. Fast track designation um, allows, again, um, expedited review of the product, um, such as the possibility for a rolling review. So typically manufacturers will bring all their data together and submit it once to the FDA. So a rolling review means that information can be submitted as it becomes available um, and allow FDA pro to provide um, feedback and review along that path. Um, and and it, that would then determine if their, their preliminary um, clin clinical data is effective and if they can continue to move forward. So I spoke of breakthrough, prime, and sagagaki de designations. And basically, there's a very similar. I know there's differences with each um, country, but basically, this allows an, a faster or accelerated assessment of the um, application to the health authorities. Um, this could also include early interactions to discuss um, other endpoints, they call them surrogate endpoints or intermediate endpoints that, that could be helpful in, in the review process. There's also a priority review that means, um, really it's, it means that if, if that is granted to, granted that the FDA would have the goal of taking action on a, a, a BLA or a, an application to the right to, to the FDA within six months. And this is um, shortened from the typical 10 month standard review. The last designation is called RMAT or regenerative medicine um, advanced therapy designation. And this, this designation is specific to cell and gene therapies. And um, it, it does include all the benefits of fast track and breakthrough designation, but it also addresses potential ways to support an accelerated approval and also ways to satisfy some post-approval requirements. I know that was a lot. Again, um, there's a lot of information um, on these designations online. There's guidance documents from, from FDA, and again, the links are here um, for, for your reference. So shifting gears a bit to think about, you know, what are the considerations for patients and families? And, and as I mentioned earlier, I, in, in rare disease and gene therapies, I, honestly, I think in any, any um, type of drug development, Families and advocacy groups play an integral part of the process um, from bringing a clinical trial to fruition um, along the path to approval as well as after approval. So um, advocacy groups and patients can help the support of understanding the disease. Um, families can also participate in, in natural history studies or other types of research to better um, understand the disease. You know, I've learned so much from the patients and families that I've worked with in the past, from Cure SMA, from the groups we worked, patients and families we worked with in focus groups, um, you know, from educating us about the therapeutic areas, the specialists in the disease, and the unmet needs. Um, families can also um, and provide insight into clinical trial design, so understanding what um, outcomes are, are the most important to them. Uh, it can also help us as a manufacturer identify educational gaps 
and um, develop resources that align, align to their needs. So, uh, uh, you know, example could be perhaps there needs to be more education around gene therapy. And I know many of us, um, including clinicians, and have worked with ASGCT to to, um, to to develop tools that can educate families. Um, advocacy groups can also host patient-focused drug development meetings, which educate the FDA. And the groups are also really um, helpful and, and drove. Uh, QRSMA, for example, newborn screening. Uh, it's amazing that almost all babies, it's getting closer, are being screened for SMA at birth now. So that was truly driven um, in collaboration with QRSMA and other industry partners, as well as families. They can also... Um, Families and groups can also drive genetic testing um, and prenatal testing where applicable. And lastly, after approval, um, payers, um, again, because many of these diseases are rare, need education. And that comes um, um, from, from advocacy groups as well. This is probably just a short list in the beginning of all the ways it can help, but Kenneth's going to speak to a lot, of, a lot of that in his presentation as well. I'm going to touch just a bit on natural history study. I think I covered some of this earlier, but um, again, natural history studies could help accelerate rare disease drug development. Using SMA as an example, there was a, a very robust natural history study for SMA type 1. So I don't think I spoke to it, but there was not a placebo controlled in, um, in, in, any of, in, in the um, initial SMA um, gene therapy trials because of the robust natural history data that was, a, be, was able to be used as a comparator. Um, but other things that we can get out beyond a placebo is to really um, inform prevalence, different subtypes of a disease, rates of progression, um, outcomes, you know, and, and as well as thinking through trial duration and frequency of data collection. So. I think I hit on a lot of these. There's a lot of benefits to, to participating in, in natural history studies, not only for the path to clinical development, but even um, after after a program, a product approved. And this is just a shout out from former FDA commissioner Scott Gottlieb. You know, they really understand the importance of natural history studies. There was a there's a draft guidance out there which provides a lot of um, a lot of information, but it but it really what he's speaking to here is, you know, it, there's a challenge in rare disease to to understand um, and understand the disease, and this is where natural history studies can come in. So my last slide before I hand it over to Kenneth, just kind of summarize, I think I spoke more about um, the collaboration between patients and families and manufacturers and advocacy groups and manufacturers, but it's it's more than just that. I mean, of course, you need your clinical experts, preclinical experts, as well as regula regulators. And to me, the, it's, it's really keeping the patient at the center of all we all we do um, is is key to to move these therapies forward in a more expedited fashion. Um, with that, I'll I'll uh, I'll end there for now. I know we have questions later, but feel free to put them in chat. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. That was great. Can you hear me now? Great. So um, I do see a couple of questions coming through in the chat. We'll save those for the end. If anyone else has questions for Emily, please feel free to add them to the chat and we'll cover those after we hear from Kenneth. I'd like now to welcome Kenneth to share with us his perspective on how an approved gene therapy impacts a disease community. Kenneth is president of Cure SMA where he leads the organization's work to develop treatments for SMA by merging an impassioned grassroots mission with a sophisticated industry incentivizing drug development model. And I love all of that. Kenneth, welcome. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, thank you for inviting me here today to speak. It's my privilege, it's always been my privilege to be involved in this community. It's always been such a positive, optimistic community. Um, and even more now that I get the chance to tell this story, the actual changes that we're seeing happen over the last five years. So thank you for having me. 
I'm going to focus on the gene therapy treatment for SMA, but I'll start off and I'll try and give some background on SMA as a whole, the overall treatment landscape, and then the learnings that we've had over the last few years um, from getting gene therapy after approval, the access, um, the impact that gene therapy is actually having on our patients as well, the learnings that we've got from, from this next stage that we're in now. One of the key things that I'll hopefully cover and get to it uh, as we get to the end here is looking at everything that goes alongside gene therapy to make it successful. The aspects that we've paid close attention to on making sure that expectations are right in the community. There is an aspect of other treatments that are involved in making the most um, of the impact that you're going to get from gene therapy itself. Also, newborn screening, early treatment is a key factor that we've seen how we've got that implemented. But again, what that does to actually make the most of the gene therapy opportunities that are out there, minimize some of the risks as well. And the whole healthcare system that goes along with getting gene therapy as a treatment, there's aspects of care that are going to be important before and after as well. So I'll try and cover various topics on those. Also, I think what we're starting to see, the learnings that we're getting as we've moved from gene therapy in a very controlled clinical trial setting to broader across the whole US, the whole um, patient HCP community in the US, to now global access as well. And that kind of transition into a much more variable um, environment, the learnings, what we're going to have to be kind of careful as we, we see that progress happen as well. SMA. Just uh, try and quickly go through these initial slides. As you heard, it's a motor neuron disease. It's much like ALS with those motor neurons dying off, neurodegenerative, and that then leads to muscle weakness, eventually paralysis, and untreated, usually fatal. That's what happens with SMA when you have no treatments, there's nothing that you can really do about it. And that was the situation for SMA about five years ago. We couldn't do anything. It was, at that point in time, the leading genetic cause of infant death. Um, and for most cases, this most severe type of the form, the form of the disease that you're hearing about type one, normally fatal before two years of age. Um, there's about one in 50 people who are carriers of the genetic cause of the disease. And about, you see the births here, about one in 11,000, but we have about 10,000 people that are impacted by SMA in the US. One of the key things as well, untreated in the past was the diagnosis process, which was very slow, took a lot of time where symptoms had to show up before um, an accurate diagnosis took place. So symptoms mean that damage is already happening. This is critical in SMA that when you see symptoms, that means that those motor neurons are already dying off. And there's a lot of questions about how reversible that part could be. But we are now seeing huge changes. We're seeing dramatic changes and they're happening very quickly for us as well. In some ways, they're almost accelerating with what we're seeing change in the community. Um, for individual patients, but the whole community, families, the HCP system, everything around SMA is changing very quickly. Um, as I was saying, one thing that we, we had before, about 10,000 patients in the US impacted by the disease, that's changing as well. We're actually seeing the incidence of the disease start to go down, which we think is a result from newborn screening getting implemented, then also getting carrier screening being promoted more. And that does look like it's actually reducing the incidence of the disease. Maybe by a quarter so far, we wouldn't be surprised if that goes down to half. But we're also seeing the prevalence of the disease increase as we are no longer losing people. It is, in a lot of cases now, no longer fatal, especially for the newly diagnosed, pre-symptomatically treated. And so there is longer lifespans. So there's, there's kind of two interesting dynamics going on there. This is our overall treatment landscape right now. We have a drug pipeline you can see here on the right where, as was mentioned, we have three treatments that are now approved for SMA. They are all disease modifying. They are very powerful treatments that all go to the genetics, the genetic cause of SMA. Work in slightly different ways, but they are all disease modifying. They also work in different ways from the, the delivery. The delivery of these treatments is kind of one of the key things that's different between them. So Spinraza was the first treatment approved. Um, and I think the other thing to point out here is these are all genetic modifiers. And so we are going to focus on Zolgensma, which is the gene replacement. But Spinraza that was approved first and Evrisdi that was the third one approved here, both work on the genetic causes. They modulate the genetics that cause SMA. 
Spinraz is delivered intrathecally, Zolgensma intravenous, and then Evrisdi is an oral medication. So these are the three treatments that we have. On the pipeline, you can actually see after those approved treatments in blue, we have a lot of additional treatments that are coming through. Our next phase, though, is actually not so much the genetics, which we look at as we've got some really good solutions for the genetic problems. They're much more focused on the symptoms that we now see, the muscle weakness, and very much focused on can we reverse the symptoms that we're seeing? Can we bring back strength and function? So that's kind of the next stage for us. The overall access, so this is across all three of those treatments, as was mentioned before, we are now up to about 70% of everybody in the US that's impacted by SMA on at least one of these three treatments that we have approved. Taken a while, it, it's certainly a process to go through and educate payers, um, HCP system, getting hospitals set up, especially when you've got an intrathecal delivery and intravenous delivery. We need the HCPs and hospitals ready to go as well. So taking some time, taking some education, but great progress all the way along. A little bit of a stall out with COVID in the middle there, but that actually picked up and got back on track right afterwards as well. What we are seeing is access in the very young uh, cases of SMA and especially the pre-symptomatic new diagnosis cases is very high. In that those groups, we're 80 to 90% of those individuals and even maybe kind of 90% plus of the pre-symptomatically diagnosed are getting access, are getting onto treatment. It's our older patients who are currently in that group uh, that sometimes struggle with access with, with policies sometimes not covering at kind of extreme ages. But in some ways as well, it's an education process even to get those patients and their doctors to know that now you can do something about SMA. With newborn screening, we, we've been working on this for an awfully long time. It's actually probably almost 20 years since we started the first discussions just to have a dialogue going on about SMA, educating legislators on, the, on that process. And then we had to get that first treatment as a trigger before we could start. So it was actually getting Spinraza approved that then led to us starting the RUSP process and then going state by state. We are now almost there. We had South Carolina come on board just this week, and we're really left with DC that should be coming soon, and then Nevada and Hawaii. So we're there. We're up to 98% now of all births in the US getting screened for SMA. One of the key things for us was what happens after that? The, the actual early diagnosis is just a step to the critical part, which is getting on treatment early as well. We don't just want a diagnosis early and then wait. We've got to move very quickly from that, from birth, screening, diagnosis, to actually getting on treatment. And early data coming in for, from states, but this is something that we, which we think is successful. It, it's a successful um, indication that that whole system is working where we are actually seeing about 28 days as the average for people after, after birth, 28 days to get onto treatment. Uh, and compared to what that was, where it was six months, years sometimes, obviously before when we didn't have treatments, but when we did, without newborn screening, it still would take a long time and you were waiting for symptoms to show. And that would mean damage, that would mean lost motor neurons, which are gonna be very difficult to bring back. We're now seeing this 28 days on average across the US. Quickly um, here, just a few kind of the lessons learned on newborn screening, and then I'll focus more on gene therapy. We do look at this as a critical component, hand in hand with gene therapy and the other treatments to get the most benefit out of them. And also minimizing some of the risks for pre-symptomatic patients the disease is not going to be as serious. It's, it's not shown up yet. So those patients are more stable. They can handle some of the risks that are involved and bounce back in some ways quite, quite a lot better than older symptomatic patients. It is a very long process. We did focus on some early wins. We were trying to make sure that to get the whole process going, we picked off a few states that we know we're going to move, in some cases, even a couple of weeks after the Rust decision. Then in some ways, focusing on the very big states. If we can get California, that takes a huge number, huge percentage of the births going. As well, I think on keeping it a positive process, we never went negative against any states, even when we kind of saw them at the end and they were dragging, always keeping that interaction positive. And in some ways, looking at kind of the surrounding peer pressure, as you can see with Nevada on that map, hopefully kind of looking around everything that's happening around the states that are left is gonna move those that, and it did with others. Hopefully it will do that with Nevada as well to move them forward. What we're also seeing is the impact from these treatments and especially gene therapy in the whole community. 
this data here is actually not from a clinical trial. This is from our whole community, the information that we get. And it's showing in this purple bar that you see increase there, the individuals, the patients who are type one, that most severe, normally paralyzed very early, normally passing away before two years of age. We have over half of those now in our whole community because of treatment and it rolling out. They're now able to sit. That's the difference here that we're able to see in the whole community. Hopefully that gives a little flavor as well about the dramatic changes that we're seeing from fatal to these patients here in particular, actually being able to sit, they're surviving. Beyond that as well, this is an average across all. We do see some dramatic changes from what SMA was to treated what is now occurring and, and not just changing from fatal to sitting. Some type one patients are, they're able to walk. There's a lot of people who get onto treatment if it's early enough that they actually do develop with normal milestones. Sometimes it's difficult to even see that somebody there had SMA at all when they get onto treatment early compared to, again, a normally fatal disease. Focusing a little bit more now on specifically the gene replacement therapies or GENSMA that we have available. The access we look at as being a successful rollout. We have about 1,200 patients in the US, 2,400, so almost half and half then globally. Um, it's been a commercial success, about 3.4 billion in sales to date, which shows you, I think, that the access with payers, payers covering the treatment is working successfully as well. It, it takes some work to get that done, but in most cases, people are getting approved and getting insurance to cover Zolgensma. And that process is increasing. It's still rolling out globally. We have a label for Zolgensma, I think this was mentioned earlier as well, which is broader than the clinical trial criteria. It goes up to about two years of age for all types of SMA. And so also when you look at 1200 patients, that actually is the vast majority of patients who have access through the FDA label that are actually getting on treatment. It's about 10 to 15% who are getting the Zolgensma through IV delivery, getting access. And that's only out of probably about 15 to 20% who are eligible through the label. So the vast majority are actually successfully going through that payer access process. What we are focused on as well is IV is the delivery that we have approved right now intravenously. The intrathecal is the next approach, intrathecal delivery of gene therapy that could hopefully open up access for patients older than two years of age, bigger patients, um, which in our community is the majority of the prevalence right now. Those, these are our priorities moving forward. We want to see what else can we do to expand access to our older symptomatic patients and IV does have its limits and that two year label, um, the practical limits that we have there. So intrathecal delivery is what we're looking at as providing the access that we we'll want for older, larger patients, individuals in our community. It's going to be interesting to see how that plays out where there's different benefits that are going to come for those older symptomatic patients than the pre-symptomatic very young, newly diagnosed patients. And so the benefits are gonna be different. I think we're gonna to have to look at them in a segmented way um, and the FDA will as well and pay as well also on when hopefully we do get that, that IT delivery approach approved. We're also very much focused on the long-term data that we need. Gene therapy, you know, we'll talk a little bit hopefully about some of the shorter term risks that we already know about and how to manage those. Big unknowns though, what is gonna happen uh, 10, 20, 30 years from now? We have some patients that are kind of, you know, five to 10 years been on Zolgensma, but we've got to watch this long-term and what does happen. So we're trying to look at the data aspects of that. What information do we need to collect long-term? The other thing here as well is, and this is kind of, a, I think a critical part, these treatments coming in have changed the disease in a way where it is no longer SMA. It's not the disease that we knew about before. We knew, while we couldn't treat the disease, how to manage some of those symptoms. And, and we knew what was coming. We could predict what was coming. That's no longer the case. We're in a, in a completely different, very unknown situation moving forward that we need to monitor very closely. One of the key things that we focused on that I think has been important for access is making sure that the community as a whole, patients, families, HCPs have realistic expectations about what gene therapy can do, what it can't do. Um, I think one of our key things is we're not looking at this as a cure. There's certain situations, and again, especially if you get in early enough, pre-symptomatically, where you haven't lost motor neurons already, it can be looked at as a prevention. In certain cases, it is stopping the disease from showing up at all. But in terms of um, 
uh, definition of a cure is bringing back strength, function, lost nerves. That isn't what we're seeing in the community. So we need to make sure that people have that right expectation so that they know what else they might need to focus on, what else they might need to do. And that's critical for us in terms of when we look at SMA with Zolgensma, it is correcting the problems with the, the genes, the causes of SMA. But what does happen if in your body you have damage in other tissues? What do you need to focus on to help bring back damage, the symptoms that you might see in SMA and muscles? But for us, especially for a much older, much symptomatic patients, if they've lost nerve cells, is that irreversible? And even correcting the genetics there, if those nerves have gone, correcting the, gene, the genes doesn't really matter at that point in time. So a lot of this that we're focused on is also about how do we maximize the benefits? How do we minimize these short-term risks that, that we already know about that aren't unexpected? What we are also going through is the change that I mentioned earlier, going from the clinical trial stage, which was very controlled, very narrow criteria of the people that were in our clinical trials to the situation, which is as we go out into the US now, that older patients are getting treated, patients are getting treated at hospital centers that don't have that same experience as one of our key uh, clinical trial sites. So a different, more variable situation that, that families, patients um, are going into getting access to gene therapy. What we're also seeing as well now is that is going around the world where I think in some ways the variability is even more. And so we have to pay attention to, again, these other aspects of early diagnosis, early uh, treatment, the care that's important to go along with somebody before you get gene therapy, the protocols, and then afterwards as well. And as you get into these more variable, less controlled situations in the US and around the world, you've got to pay, I think, closer attention to those, again, to get the most out of the gene therapy, but but especially minimize those short-term risks. And they are kind of, they're known risks. I think we look at the immune response as something which is known and it is manageable. That's the steroid protocol that is in effect. It's part of the protocol before going on gene therapy. Um, so that's important to do accurately, correctly. It's also though something that you've got to carefully balance that now if somebody is on that steroid treatment, they are immunocompromised and you've got to now pay attention to infections and here you're talking about infections in somebody that has SMA, potentially some symptoms, and that can be kind of a, a situation you've got to very carefully monitor. I think one of the big findings from us is, you know, one of the ways really to focus on maximizing the benefits, minimizing these short-term risks is that newborn screening. That is the answer ultimately, that if you can get in before damage, if you can get in when somebody is much more stable, you know, the benefits that you're going to see long term and also the risk can then be kind of minimized so much more. But certainly for us, we are focused on what gene therapy can do now in that pre-symptomatic newborn setting where it can stop for the progression. And if symptoms haven't shown up, we look at it as a potential prevention, that aspect of you could call it so that a cure. But what about people with symptoms already, our older patients who already have damage in their body that they've lost motor neurons, gene therapy, again, through the intrathecal, we hope can have that potential to stop at that point. Um, but what about bringing back that lost strength function? Additional now symptomatic, pretty muscle focused treatments are gonna be needed on top of gene therapy to get that reverse, get the ultimate kind of definition of what we would look at as a cure. One key item here, I think, is we've always paid close attention to that's the ultimate reversing, restoring function, a cure. There is huge benefit and value in just even slowing the disease progression down. That is a big change. That is a big improvement, huge value for our patients and families. If you're just moving from natural um, downward progression of the disease to just slowing and then build upon that to then stopping further progression and ultimately reversing. Some of the learnings that we've seen as well is, as I was mentioning before, you have gene therapy. What is also important, what we've seen are other treatments both before and after. Um, we look at kind of treatments before coming in from kind of a bridging approach. And so it's sequential there that people do go on Spinraza, um, Evrisdi before getting on to Zolgensma. That's sometimes done because it can be quicker access and days can matter here after newborn screening. Also, if antibody AAV9 levels are high in an individual, sometimes you've got to wait and you can go on to a treatment there as well where you're in that kind of waiting period. Also, there is the approach and we're seeing this happen, I think more than expected, people going on to a treatment after getting gene therapy. 
I think especially this is in cases where somebody already has symptoms. Um, they haven't maybe come through, they, they weren't caught by newborn screening, but they got gene therapy when they already had some treatments there. It can then stop further progression. People, patients, families in the SMA community are then looking at adding on top of that. So people do get Spinraza, Evrisdi in what is actually then a combination as gene therapy is permanent in there. So on two of those treatments at the same time, I think as well here, then we're looking almost at that third piece on top of that. What about treatments that are designed to bring back strength, uh, restore the muscle strength that people have lost? So just to sum up here, um, last slide, and then I think we'll, we'll get to some questions. Um, hopefully this came across there that when we're talking about gene therapy in the SMA space, it's a lot of these other processes, infrastructure that are very important for the success that we've seen access and impact that it is very important for people to have realistic expectations. And we are very careful. And I hopefully came across here, not looking at gene therapy as a cure that there's other things that you're going to have to pay attention to, whether it could be potential other treatments, but I think much more importantly, the aspects of care, such as physical therapy, watching pulmonary function that you're still going to need to do after getting gene therapy. And we want to make sure that people aren't taking their eye off the ball there that there can be a risk if people aren't paying attention to, to those aspects of dealing with the disease when some symptoms might be there. Much better situation, but the symptoms might still be there to take care of. That aspect, again, of treatments before and after have been critically important in, in SMA, and, and that's important that we always looked at it that way, but gene therapy isn't just a one done, that's all you're going to need as a community. Other treatments are going to be needed alongside it before, after, and it's not going to be the answer for everybody. Um, again, right now, we only have gene therapy for two years and under. The majority of patients in the SMA community, probably about 50 to 60%, are on Spinraza and Evrisdi. The advocacy approach is a long-term approach to get that early diagnosis in place. And again, critically, as that's just the middle step in some ways to them making sure that treatments, when you have them available, get in before damage to give that kind of maximum benefit. And this long-term um, collection of data SMA is very um, different now. We we have unknowns of how we're going to care for the disease. Gene therapy as well as what I was saying looks great. It is kind of showing its longevity in SMA patients for as long as we've had them in right now. But we want to watch for 10, 20, 30 years from now. Um, and again, pay attention to that long term. Their safety, certainly, but also is anything else needed, again, to make the most of that gene therapy potential that's already in there. And I think that's my next slide. So maybe want to turn it back to Betsy. That's great. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. And oh, great. There's Emily. <laughs> I, I'd like to start our discussion with a, a great question from the chat. And I think you can probably both speak a little bit to this, which is patient focused drug development forums. Emily, you mentioned this as a way to help the FDA understand a disease. Could you talk a little bit about when that event is most helpful in the drug development cycle? And kind of maybe you can talk a little bit about the community's role in that. You know, who's initiating it? What should a community leader out there be thinking about um, to make the most impactful forum it can be? Yeah, it's a really great, great question. And I, I, I get asked that quite a bit, actually. And, I, and, and honestly, you know, what you hear from FDA is early and often. Um, but I also understand that a patient-focused drug development meeting is a lot of work, um, takes a lot of effort, a lot of organization. Actually, I know Kenneth hosted one with Cure SMA. You could speak to that as well. You know, what, what someone shared with me once, and this may not be the right answer, is that usually around phase two, early phase three of development is a good time. Um, and that, but, but you also want to make sure that your organization has the infrastructure to support a patient-focused drug development meeting. So not only, you know, bringing the voice of the patient in, but also being able to take all of those um, learnings, summarize them, write up a report, or even publish them. And I know, uh, as an example, this is something that Kira SMA had done. Um, so it's more it's it's more about okay making sure that that things are progressing perhaps a completed phase one looks like things are progressing to to later stage trials but then also that that your organization has the infrastructure to take what you find publish it and and also be able to 
um, put those learnings out. But Kenneth, I'm curious your thoughts on that. Um, that I thought that was good advice um, that you shared with me. Maybe just echoing there, I think it's it's not just a one-time event as well. It is early. It's it's an ongoing dialogue with the FDA, and in some ways, much before a patient-focused drug development meeting, informal interactions, making sure that they understand the disease, that they're aware of kind of the, the treatment landscape. Um, so I think what I'd say as well is with regulators, the FDA, but also this has been our approach with other stakeholder groups, the payers, ISA, and groups like that, we're making sure that it's always a balance. It's data. That is important and anecdotes, personal stories. We've always looked at it can't just be one or the other. They, they have to work together. Um, then it's informal early leading into these more formal interactions with, with the FDA. Um, what I will say, it is a lot of work, but this is our finding as well, that that same kind of set of information, data, anecdotes, you can use over and over with industry partners, as I was saying, with payers, with the HCP kind of uh, system as a whole. So a big investment, but you get a lot of use from it. I'd say as well that we we did the kind of the very formal patient focused drug development meeting. We actually just recently did a follow up listening session with the FDA to keep them in the loop. Again, it's not one and done. We're making sure the FDA is seeing what's happening, newborn screening, what's the impact from gene therapy. So they're in the loop. Um, and I'll say this as well, that they're motivated. They 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 part. They have always been a good partner to us. We want to bring them into the community so they see what's happening, what the impact is long term as well from their decisions and their, and their actions. That's great. I love how you just talked about both data and anecdotes having a role. I think that's a super important point, Kenneth. You also mentioned ICER in there, and I maybe want to ask a little bit about that. So, so ICER is this step after FDA approval of a gene therapy. It's a cost effectiveness evaluation of a of a therapy. Um, I'm wondering if you can share your perspective on on what an ICER meeting is like. What was it like for you for the SMA community? What role did the patient community play in that step in the in the pro the process of getting to market access? So again, I'd say it was a lot of the same information, a lot of the same stories, but data that we collect from the the patient community that we shared with ICER. Um, I think some of the key key factors that came up there was making sure that ISA was able to kind of have a more nuanced model of what a disease is, but also what the impact of treatment is going to be and specific to SMA, that it wasn't just kind of a comparison of fatal versus no disease at all. It was them understanding that there's a lot of value that patients get in between. And you almost saw it there that there is huge value to a patient from going from fatal to sitting. They might still have SMA, they're, they're sitting, they're, they're in a wheelchair there. But there's huge value. So kind of the utility um, valuations that go along with those kind of interim steps, making sure that that's built into the model. I think as well for us, rare disease and, and everything, but it's making sure that that value beyond just the individual patient does get factored in. SMA is so devastating. So the impact, if you get rid of the disease on family members, parents, grandparents, society at large, that needs to get factored in. And I think the other part, which I I think we stressed, but maybe didn't yet get factored into kind of some of the models is what we're talking about here, which is, you know, progress in one disease area helps others. And what's the value in that, that there's value from one orphan disease sharing kind of results, findings that are going to go much beyond just one disease area. The difficulty, one of the difficulties that we saw was kind of that valuation methodology around longevity. And it is here, it's how do you factor in a change from two years to 60 years as a lifespan? Um, and some of the models probably don't factor everything in. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, there, there's a follow-up question in, in the chat that, that asks a little bit about natural history study um, data and how important that is. And, and that's a little bit of what you're describing. Um, maybe can you share a little bit more about how important that is um, to develop? Um, Emily, for you, maybe any more specifics around what role that played in Zolgensma's development? First. You want me to go first? I'll just, I'll just comment briefly that, you know, the natural history study was, was critical um, for Zolgensma development. There, um, for the SMA type one studies, there wasn't a need for a placebo control, meaning that every patient that was in the clinical trial was on drug. And, um, you know, for the patient community, that's a huge win. 
Um, and, and that also, you know, that, that data was, was helpful in having a greater understanding of the disease. So oftentimes um, that helps develop clinical trial endpoints. But I think also one thing Kenneth mentioned, you know, often as you're getting closer to approval, you start to build the burden of illness modeling that goes into ICER, right? You, uh, some of the things that Kenneth had talked about. And so this allows us to better quantify what this is. We do additional research on, you know, what is the cost of that care? Um, you know, to payers, so you can you can make that payer argument, so they can see there's actually a long-term cost savings. And in the case of Zolgensma, that was that was found. Um, so I think, again, there, there's many ways, but those are two things that that really stick out in, in my mind. Um, I think it was very important to have that kind of robust. Uh, clinician entered natural history data on the disease. And so it was, and maybe you'll see where I'm going in a bit, but clinician entered very robust. The FDA could rely upon it. And here this is that if you can get that as a robust data set, and now you're looking at a powerful impact from gene therapy, people can trust that that difference is real. They can rely on the data and you've got robust changes that are going to happen in narrow, small clinical trials. And you can really kind of trust that the treatment is having that dramatic impact from what natural history was. The one thing I'll say as well is, and I'm not meaning anecdotes here, that one of the critical things for us was we were collecting clinician entered natural history data. We were also collecting data from patients, the patient voice, but real data. And to be able to kind of merge those two together gives you that perspective of value beyond just a clinical change to what does that mean in a patient's life? And again, not just, it's nice to have a story, um, but if you can back that up with showing kind of impact across a whole community, what that really means in somebody's life when they're seeing a change in their daily life because of treatment and how valuable that is to them to get independence, participation, those things are what we did, especially with ISA, try to bring in to show, again, even that incremental improvement. It's not just going from a fatal disease, but if somebody can uh, brush their hair, if they can now control a power wheelchair to move around, uh, brush their own teeth those levels of independence are hugely valuable. And that comes from these treatments. It's amazing. Um, Emily, you have a passion for patient advocacy. I'm wondering if you can share one thing a patient community can do to help get a gene therapy. Mm -hmm. We've talked about a lot today. Um, certainly, you know, starting natural history studies are important. Honestly, I think what I've learned, it's it's the passion that the advocacy groups and the families bring, not only to industry, to scientists, to the FDA, to payers. To me, it's just bringing their passion, their voice to the right stakeholder to move things along. I know several parents who have raised money and funded early preclinical work, you know, and and that is helps actually the existence of many many companies, you know, um, and and to move these things forward. So honestly, it's that it's that passion, it's that you know, just not giving up, um, being resilient, and and continuing the path forward. I think is really the most important thing to to all these different pieces along the way. Great, and Kenneth, last question for you. You made an important point that gene therapy is not necessarily a cure. A lot of patient communities have big hopes for gene therapy. And I'm wondering if there was any suggestion you would leave the audience with to help set realistic expectations for the patient communities out there um, around what the gene therapy reality may be. So hopefully some of that information I was showing kind of will we'll show here in a real world setting you need these other things going on and you won't get the most out of gene therapy if you don't pay attention to these other areas. So, so that's the side that it can be transform, transformational gene therapy. Again, in some cases, when you have these other things in place, we're seeing normal development if, and a prevention of symptoms showing up. So it's got that huge potential, but it, maybe it's almost that angle of you're not going to get the most out of it if you don't pay attention to these other things. You might lose the potential of gene therapy if you're not getting newborn screening in place. 
you might, if you know, if you don't have those bridging therapies and you've got antibodies and you can't get onto gene therapy, again, you need these other factors to come in. Um, so it just isn't a, it's not just that it's not a cure, it's just not a one-shot approach. You're going to need infrastructure, other factors, the community kind of working together, making sure that everybody, including the HCPs, have the right expectations. So that you make the most of what gene therapy actually has as potential. Amazing. Emily and Kenneth, thank you so much for sharing your incredibly valuable experience with everybody here listening. Um, it's been a real treat to, to hear what each of you has learned along the way. Um, thanks to everybody online for attending and for listening. We hope that you enjoyed today's presentations and discussion. We will post this recorded session on the patient education website at ASGCT early next week and send an email to all of you when it's available. And if you found this information useful, please feel free to share it. The next Lunch and Learn will be on October 27th, where experts in the field will go over what they do in the lab and how the work that they do advancing gene therapies for patients in need um, relates to the work of, of patient organizations to help advance the science um, and how all of those stakeholders interact together. Registration for that is open on the ASGCT patient education website. Um, we hope you'll join us then. And thanks again to everyone and have a great rest of your day.